everyone, welcome back. Today I'm talking to Becky Kilner from the Museum of Zoology. Hi Becky, how are you? Hi, I'm good thanks, how are you? All right, thank you very much. Thank you for talking to us today. No um, Becky, I've got a few questions for you today. Um, first of all, what job do you do and what do you enjoy about it? Okay, so I have two jobs really. Um, so one of my job titles is that I'm the director of the Museum of Zoology here in Cambridge. And the other is that I'm a professor of evolutionary biology. And they're kind of, they're not uh, unrelated to each other, um, but they mean uh, have to do different things at different times of the day, usually. And, and I enjoy every aspect of, of both jobs. It's fantastically fortunate to have a job like that, where every day I look forward to coming to work because I never know what's gonna happen and something interesting will turn up for sure. And I suppose the thing that they have in common is that, um, in a small way, they help people feel a little bit better about their everyday lives. So we do that in the museum by engaging people with the wonders of the natural world. And when you're fully caught up in the drama of the natural world, it's a fantastic feeling because you're transported beyond yourself and you're learning and you're exploring a different world to your everyday world. And you're thinking about big ideas at the same time, like evolutionary biology where did we come from in the first place how do we fit into this whole scheme of things and so you can't help but be excited and in a small way diminished in your own small world made to feel part of a much bigger experience I think that's a good sensation for everyone and then as a professor I have a research group and I teach undergraduates and so I hope that I can share some of my enthusiasm for the natural world with them as well perhaps in a different way and make them excited about it and encourage them to think more broadly about how they can make discoveries of their own. That's wonderful. I never thought of it like that, just thinking about your position in the world going to the Museum of Zoology. It's fascinating. Thank I you. think it happens whatever museum you go into, to be honest. They, they take you out of yourself and you learn about a new world wherever you go. Yeah, you're right. That's wonderful. On museums, have you always wanted to work in a museum? Um, no, I never imagined for a minute that I would end up working in a museum, but then I also never imagined that I would one day be a professor. So every step of the way, I've just kind of followed my nose and done the thing that I find most interesting at that point. So I've never really thought beyond the next five years. And my thinking for that five years has been guided by what I find most interesting and exciting to do at that point. And I've been lucky enough to just keep going and going and going uh, so far during my career. Great, thank you. Uh, you mentioned that you're a professor. Can you tell mm -hmm. us about your educational pathway? Uh, well, I went to school like everyone else uh, and then I did A-levels. And when I was doing, so I did science A-levels, um, biology and chemistry and maths. And while I was doing that combination of subjects, I start, I didn't, I did biology reluctantly, I have to say. I found it the least interesting subject when I started my A-levels, but obviously by the time I finished, it was my favorite. And so I decided to have it, uh, try and do a degree in biology. I went to Oxford to do zoology. And then I, I loved that so much, I just wanted to keep going. And so I thought I'd quite like to do a PhD. And so I ended up coming back to Cambridge actually to do my PhD. And then every, you know, initially you don't have long-term funding. You just have to review everything every three to five years. And so each step of the way, I'd, I got immersed into a different project. I got excited by it and I could see where to go next with it and was lucky enough to get the money to do it. And then eventually when I was in my 30s, I managed to land a job, permanent job in the zoology department as a lecturer. And so just kind of continued in that vein ever since. Great. Thank you. Um, what was your experience of work before now I mean you've talked a little bit about sort of landing a job in the department of zoology but what types of roles have you done in the past and I mean everything yeah okay so um well when I was a student I did all sorts of interesting jobs like washing up in restaurants and mopping floors and cleaning and, and that kind of thing um and then um well so the I suppose as a as a academic you kind of progress through a series of postdoctoral positions and they were um, fellowships which actually allowed me to do quite a bit of field work. I did I spent a, a long time going every year to do field work in Australia so I'd have uh, two summers every year so every time the, the um, night started to draw in here in the UK I'd fly off to Australia and I'd spend uh, a summer in Australia ca carrying out field work just outside Canberra studying 
cuckoo Australian cuckoos and their hosts and then I'd fly back in time for spring here and then do a field season here so I did I managed to keep that up for about 10 years but it was quite uh, it was fantastic to have the opportunity to travel and see different things and just doing field work is a, a wonderful experience to be outside every day engaging in the natural world um, but after a while it gets a little bit disruptive on your personal life so I was quite happy to say goodbye to that and that coincided with me getting my job in, in Cambridge and forcing me to stay put in one place and so at that point I switched to from studying birds outside to studying insects in the lab and so we have these huge populations of burying beetles which we collect from woodlands all around Cambridgeshire and we um, evolve them in different ways in the lab and we try and mimic the patterns of evolution uh, in the laboratory populations that we, we think have happened in, in the natural populations in the woods surrounding Cambridge. Wow, <laughs> that's yeah. different. So, so that's where those, that, those are the kinds of jobs that I did, uh, which took me to being a professor. And then um, I became, my, my group grew and so I became uh, more involved in managing people. And I could see how that was a rewarding side to life as well as educating and, and getting other people excited about science. Um, because if you create an environment in which people want to work, then they can, you know, blossom into the people that are their best selves. And that's a very rewarding experience as a, as a manager. And so I became more interested in doing that kind of thing. And then the opportunities to do more of that led me to the directorship of the museum. Wonderful. Thanks, Becky. Um, what are the most important skills and attributes that you need for your job? Uh -huh. Uh, well, obviously, uh, for this specific job, I think a kind of passion for the natural world is crucial, but a passion for anything I think is crucial. Um, and it's, But in terms of kind of more um, attributes about myself, I think it's really important to be self-aware, so to know what you're good at, but also what you're not so good at, and how people see you, and how people see you being not so good at some things and much better at other things. I think it's good to be able to put yourself in other people's shoes so that they can see things. You can see how they're seeing things for the first time. And that's true whether they're coming into the museum and seeing something they've never seen before or whether they're encountering a problem that they've never thought about before. Or uh, if they're just, you know, everyday problems that crop up in the workplace, if you can see everyone's point of view, it helps iron out those difficulties. I think it's really important to have good communication skills, that people trust you and believe you when you tell them things. Um, and I think it's really important to have an ability to spot an opportunity and absolutely go for it and take people with you in that journey. Great, thank you. Uh, last question. Um, what would you tell your younger self if you had the opportunity? Uh, oh, so many things. Um, stop worrying. It'll be fine. Um, and don't be put off by all the loud voices that you hear confidently proclaiming things around you. So it took me quite a long time to work this out, but when I did, it was incredibly empowering. And um, so what I've realised is that there are, there's a kind of two groups of people in the world, and one is good people that talk loudly about everything and seem to know the right answer at the right time in a very public display. And then there's another group of people that sort of more quietly go through life and sit a bit in the corner and um, can feel a bit overwhelmed by the people that are publicly displaying their confidence. And actually, both groups of people, I think, are just as insecure as each other, and they just show it in different ways. And as soon as you know that, because I'm one of the people that sits quietly in the corner, usually, as soon as you know that, it's a lot easier to manage situations and to realise that you're all facing up to difficult problems and trying to find your own way through it. And just people do things in different ways, but not to be intimidated by that kind of scenario. Great. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Becky, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, and I mm. hope to see you again soon. Yes, thank you.